And in our text this morning, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we get a glimpse into those divinely imposed limitations that actually made Jesus' ministry so effective. Jesus didn't get up in the morning and say, well, where do you think we ought to go today? Jesus limited himself to the Father's will and the Father's purposes. And here's the point. You and I would be wise to do the same thing. Jesus was the Messiah. People mocked and they said, is the Messiah to come from Galilee? They were saying nothing good can happen here. Nothing great from God can happen here. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said at your place of business? Well, you know, God's not going to do anything here. Listen, friend, here's what you need to know about God. God can do a great work anywhere when people don't limit him. Our job is to take people to a better place called heaven. That's our job. He ministered to massive crowds. He, uh, he preached to multitudes. He healed throngs of people. But the majority of his time, his primary focus was on the 12. What Jesus did was socially unacceptable. It's not about us adding value to Jesus. It's about Jesus adding value to us. Even though you have a dark past, because of Jesus, you can have a bright future. Listen, that's the story of the gospel. That's the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus has limited himself to reaching the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ to to those of us whose lives have already been changed. Because you see, the answer to the question this morning, is Jesus' ministry limited today, is this, yes. His ministry is limited today by people like you and me. We're the ones who determine the impact of Jesus' ministry. There's no limit to what God can do if we do what God has called us to do and we keep the main thing the main thing. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to be looking at a parable this morning that's the most, one of the most well-known but most misunderstood parables Jesus ever told. In fact, when I read it in just a moment, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I, I, I know this parable. But the fact of the matter is, most people have no idea what it's really about. And in this parable that Jesus uses, that he shares, he answers the question of why, throughout all of human history, the majority of people have rejected the gospel. The majority. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. When I uh, went to Bible college way too many years ago to admit here publicly this morning, they talked about reaching the world for Christ, and I signed on for that. I wanted to reach the world for Christ, but the fact of the matter is we're not going to do that. The majority of the world is going to reject Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us why in this parable. He also addresses the heart of the human problem. It's the problem of the human heart, as we'll see in just a moment. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. And uh, if you have one of those Bibles that has like headings above sections... Your Bible may say, the parable of the sower. How many of you have a Bible that says that? That's not what this parable is about. Now, what you need to know is chapter headings and all that stuff, those have been added by men to the Word of God. But you're going to find out today, this is not the parable of the sower. In fact, the sower is not even mentioned in our text. Something else. Jesus used to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I just say, listen up. Listen up. Verse 4, and when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who Hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. Jesus would say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen up. You may be seated. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, in case you're visiting with us, we go verse by verse through Bible books. We don't hop around, pick and choose the nice parts and all that. We go right through Bible books, and we're going through the Gospel of Luke, and we've been doing it for over a year now. You say, what are you doing in chapter 8? Well, we take our time. We don't want to hurry past it. And in our study of the Gospel of Luke, we come now to verse 4, and in verse 4, there's an obvious change in the teaching of Jesus. He starts teaching in parables. Now, the word parable means to lay alongside. You have a truth you want shared, so you lay a story alongside. Some have said a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So why did Jesus start speaking in parables? He answers it in verse 10. He said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Jesus used parables for two reasons, to conceal the truth from some people, and to reveal the truth to other people. Now, who's he going to conceal it from? Those who had rejected him, and had rejected his message. Jesus was saying to them, use it or lose it. The fact of the matter is, if you hear the truth and you don't put that truth into practice, you lose that truth. Like muscles that atrophy, if somebody strapped your arm to your side and you didn't use it for a long time, the time would come when you couldn't use it anymore. And literally, the truth of God's Word, it's not enough for us to come and take notes and read Scripture and walk out and say, great message, great study, and don't do anything about it, because here's the deal. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, if you receive the truth, God will give you more. If all you do is just bring your little thimble, and I know Sarah going, what's a thimble? It's a monopoly piece. No, it, um, <laughs> it's a little metal cup that that women used to put on their finger when they were sewing so the needle didn't go on their finger, right? Did I describe it right? But you come with your little thimble and you fill it up with the Word on Sunday and then on your way out you dump it on the porch as you go get in your car. That's not going to do you a bit of good. If you don't do anything with the truth you hear, if you don't apply it to your life, God won't give you any new truth. But if you do, He'll give you more. So the parables were to conceal the truth from some people, those who had rejected Christ and his message, and the parables were used to reveal the truth to those who believed and received Jesus and his message. Now this parable also explains to us why the whole world is not going to be saved. They're not. Now you know when you hear the gospel, when I hear the gospel, we think, man, this is awesome, and why wouldn't anyone with a functioning two-pound brain be smart enough to say, this is what I want? But it's not true. In fact, Jesus tells us in this parable, the majority of the people of all time and in the world today will reject him and reject the gospel. So what's the problem? I mean, why why don't people want to respond to the gospel? You want to know what the problem is? It's people's hearts. 
The parable Jesus tells is often referred to, in fact, I had mentioned it earlier, to the parable of the sower. That's not what it is. It's the parable of the soils. It's also found in Matthew chapter 13. It's also found in Mark chapter 4. It's a simple story, really. A sower goes out to sow some seed. Some seed falls on the path. Birds come and pick it up. Some seed falls on the rock or the stony ground, and there's no depth. There's there's no productivity. Some seed falls among thorns, and it gets choked out. Some seed falls on good soil, and it brings forth fruit. That's the whole story. So what's the problem here? Let's analyze the parable and see if we can't figure it out. Number one, what about the sower? In verse 5, you know, the, it's interesting when you ask the question, well, who is the sower? Luke doesn't identify who the sower is. Neither does Mark. Now, Matthew says Jesus is the sower. Well, that's not where the problem is. Amen? There's not a problem with Jesus. You know, when Jesus was here, he he sowed seed everywhere he went. But the response was disappointing. Sometimes people say, well, if I could have just seen Jesus in the flesh, if I could have just been here when Jesus was here, I would have believed. That's not true. Most of the people who did see him and hear him and witness him in person did not believe. Let that sink in for a moment. Now that Jesus has gone to heaven, he's no longer here to sow seed. Every one of us has the job of sowing the seed of the Word of God wherever we go. That's our job. Sow the seed. How are we to do it? Well, first of all, plentifully. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Paul says the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. That's why we need to put out a lot of Scripture seed. We do that here at Crossroads. We, we do all kinds of things to uh, sow the seed of the gospel, whether it's a concert, whether it's a hallelujah carnival, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's giving food away at our Helping Hands ministry. We're still trying to share the gospel. We're still trying to plant the seed. One of the reasons why I love our sports ministry, which is unbelievable. Randy Staggs and his team, they do an amazing job. All the volunteers, all the coaches, all the referees, all the people. It's an amazing, an amazing ministry. But you know what they do? At every game, during halftime, someone shares a devotion from the Word, and they sow the seed, and they read a scripture, and they invite people to come and worship at Crossroads and be a part of this church, and they pray for people. We're sowing the seed plentifully. See, we never know what's, what, what, what the seed's going to do. We don't, we don't know what's going to come up. We just sow the seed plentifully. We also sow the seed passionately. Psalm 126, verse 6. The psalmist says, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, and it doesn't mean he doesn't want to go sowing and that's why he's crying. He doesn't want to do this. It's, it's talking about someone whose heart, they're, they're passionate about this, and they want it to be good. And He says, they shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, we, we ought to pray that God would break our hearts for the lost. When's the last time you wept over your neighborhood, or, or wept over your community, or wept over your country? It ought to break our hearts, what we see happening around us. And and if our hearts were broken, we'd we'd, we'd sow more passionately. By the way, seeds soaked in water prior to planting are more productive. Third way we ought to sow, patiently. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Do you see the picture that Solomon's painting? It's someone who's sowing seed all day long. In the morning, at night, just, just stay at it. Don't give up. Paul said the same thing, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. He said, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but... 
when I sow seed, I want to see a harvest right away. You like that? We're, we're, we're a little impatient. It's like we, we I, I remember several years ago, there was a fellow, I was a pastor of a church in Florida, and he gave, he gave $1,000 uh, for a new piano. We were, we were wanting to get a new piano for our church, and he gave $1,000 for this new piano. By the way, he was our piano player. And it wasn't too long after that, he quit the church. And, you know, as I've done hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of times ago, what, what in the world is that all about? And I found out that he got upset because someone had told him that if he gave $1,000, God would bless him 100 times over and he'd get 100000 back. And in the process, he'd have a new piano to play in church. What kind of nut stuff is that? But that's the way a lot of us are. We, we pray a prayer, and we're ready for the answer right now. We're ready for the phone to ring. or ready for the job offer to be there, right? No, we need to sow patiently. And listen, it can't be harvest time all the time. We've got to spend time sowing. We've got to spend time cultivating. We've got to spend time preparing. We've got to spend time watering. Just be patient. The harvest will come. This past week, I went to Denver, Colorado to get away for a couple days of rest and and it was spending time with one of our church planners. We're, we're supporting a church in Denver called Cross Culture Church. And Michael and Mindy Winokur, our pastor and pastor's wife, and they're great people. And, and they had over 250 for Easter. And they're not even one year old. Just doing a great job. And, and, but Michael was saying to me, he goes, yeah, but you had 24,000 people at your church. I said, Michael, 25 years ago when I came to be the pastor of this church, we didn't have 250 for Easter. He said, wow. I said, listen, you, you keep showing up, you keep doing what's right, and you watch what God does. And I said, 25 years goes like that. You just keep sowing the seed. Just sow the seed. So the problem is not the sower. What about the seed? Verse 11, maybe there's something wrong with the seed. Well, in verse 11, Jesus said, the seed is the Word of God. Listen, sorry, there is not a problem with the Word of God. Amen? It's not a problem with the Word of God. Nothing wrong with the seed. You know, the Word of God's wonderful seed. It is a wonderful seed. What a privilege we have to sow the seed of God's Word into people's hearts. In fact, I would say it's the best seed there is. You know, seeds have life in them. Inside every seed, there's a, there's a certain genetic code. Some, some seeds have the genetic imprint of corn in them. Did you know that? And if you plant them, you'll get a crop of corn. Others have the genetic code of, of tomatoes in them, and if you plant those seeds, you get tomatoes. There's life implanted in the genetic code of the seed. Remember several years ago, they, they found King Tut's tomb, and they opened his casket, and inside they found some seeds. Remember that story? And they planted them. And you know what they did? They, they brought forth fruit. 3,000-year-old seeds that had laid in a coffin for all those years, and yet they bring them out, plant them in the ground, water them, and they bring forth fruit. You say, why is that? Because there's life in the seed. Now, let me tell you about this wonderful seed called the Word of God. The Word of God has the genetic code of eternity in it. That's why, listen, when you come to church and you hear the Word of God, there's something eternal that stirs in your heart, and you know it's right. Even if you don't want to do it, you know it's right. Even if you don't agree with it, you know it's right. Why? There's a, there's a genetic imprint in the Word, the seed of the Word of God that's eternal. And that's why when the seed is planted in a heart that's open to the gospel, it produces eternal life. To put it another way, people come to life when the seed of the Word of God is planted in them. That's why you can be having your quiet time in the morning. And what I do on Sunday mornings, I, I do you, you, you version on my iPhone. And I let, while I'm shaving, the guy's reading the Word of God to me. And I got to tell you, that's almost every morning I go, Whoa, wait, wait a minute. And I hit that and I go back. I, I didn't know it said that. It's like something comes to life. 
When you center the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, there'll, there'll be a verse, there'll be a truth, there'll be a principle that will, that will get to your heart, and all of a sudden you'll come alive. Why? The seed of the Word of God has eternity planted in it. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and abiding Word of God. We have wonderful seed in the Word of God. But it's not just wonderful, it's powerful. It's a powerful seed. Did you know if a seed falls into the crack of a sidewalk, it'll eventually buckle that concrete? That's just the power of a seed. And the Word of God, the seed of the Word of God is powerful. It can change your life. It can change your family. It can change your business. It can change a nation. If it hits the right soil, It's powerful. See, listen, this church is filled with people whose lives have been powerfully transformed by the wonderful seed of the Word of God. That's how you go from 240 people 25 Easter's ago to 24,000 people 25 years later. Why? The seed is powerful. But not only that, it's fruitful. It brings forth a crop. You know, I lived in Florida for 12 and a half years, and, and they had orange orchards everywhere. They even had some apple orchards. And, <clears throat> you know, you can, you can go into either an orange orchard or an apple orchard, and you can, you, can bring, you can bring an apple out if you want to, out of that apple orchard. You can take an apple out of that orchard. And if you're, if you're good, you can do it without them catching you. I wouldn't recommend it. But did you know you can take an orchard out of that one apple? That's the power of fruitfulness in the seed. And it's a picture of the fruitfulness of the Word of God. So the sower's not the problem, and the seed's not the problem. What about the soil? Number three, people's hearts. The soil represents the different conditions of the human heart. And the human heart is like soil where seed can be sown. Now, the human heart has great potential. It can become a a beautiful garden or it can become a jungle. Left to itself, the human heart can become a vacant lot of weeds and brush and thorns. That's why it's insane when parents say, well, I'm just going to let my kids grow up and believe whatever they want. No, you don't. Listen, you don't leave the human heart alone. You need to plant the seed of the Word of God in it, or you're in trouble. Did you know what the Bible says about your heart and mine? By the way, we're not talking about the heart muscle. We're talking about the soul of our being. When we say the word heart, we're talking about who we really are, not just a muscle. But I would tell you, if your muscle's bad, you're in trouble. And if your soul is bad, you're in worse trouble. Spiritual death is far worse than physical death. You're going to experience physical death whether you want to or not, unless the rapture comes. That's mine. That's what I'm praying for. That'd be just great. Lord, take us out of here. But if that doesn't happen, you're going to experience physical death. But what's worse than that is spiritual death, eternal separation from God. So when we talk about the heart, we're talking about your soul, and I want you to know what the Bible says about your heart and mine. 21 warnings in Scripture that I can count about our hearts. Here's what it says about our hearts. Number one, our heart is wicked. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 23. I don't have time to read all these verses. I mean, we were late the first service, and I didn't read any of those verses. You just have to read them on your own. Number one, wicked. Number two, desperately sick. Jeremiah 17, 9. Number three, perverse. Proverbs 11, 20. Talking about your heart and mine. Number four, evil. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. Jeremiah 3, 17. Say, Pastor, I can't write that fast. Just listen to it when it's online, okay? Come back and fill those in. Every place I go, people say, you talk too fast. I say, no, you listen too slow. Number five, insane. Our heart is insane. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3. Number six, unclean. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14. 
Number seven, deceitful, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Number eight, disloyal, 1 Kings 15, verse 3. Number nine, errant, Psalm 95, verse 10. Number 10, unrepentant, Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Talking about our hearts. Number 11, unbelieving, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Number 12, blind, Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Number 13, deceived, Isaiah 44, verse 20. The title of my message today is a shocking truth about your heart. Pretty shocking, isn't it? Number 14, hardened. Our heart is hardened. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Number 15, proud. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5 and 21, verse 4. Number 16, talking about our hearts. Greedy. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. Number 17, foolish. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Number 18, idolatrous. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. Talking about our hearts. Number 19, rebellious. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23. Number 20, stubborn. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23. And number 21, dull. Acts chapter 28, verse 27. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why when someone tells you to follow your heart, that's incredibly bad advice. (laughs) Incredibly bad advice. And parents, you need to know, seed is being planted into the hearts of your children, whether you like it or not. And you need to make sure they're getting the Word of God planted into their heart. You see, the human heart, without Christ, without the seed of the Word of God, can become a swamp of shame and a jungle of guilt and embarrassment and pain and pollution. The picture of your heart and mine is not a good one. Not at all. And that's why we need to plant the seed of God's Word into the human heart. That's the only hope. Now, Jesus said there's Basically, four responses. When you plant the seed into a human heart, there are basically four responses. Uh, The first one is the unresponsive heart. We see that in verse 5 and verse 12. That's described by the hard path. The seed never makes it past the surface. They've been hardened. They've been beaten down by everything that comes down the path. They let everybody trample them and every idea and every fad and everything. And and they're just, they're just, it's, there's just nothing there. So the devil comes along and he can snatch that seed right out like a bird. That's one response. The second one is the impulsive heart. We see that in verse 6 and verse 13. That's the rocky path. There's some soil, but there's not very much of it. There's, there's no depth. And this is the person that makes a quick, shallow, emotional response, but doesn't last. You ever notice that? I've watched people for 40-some years since I've been in the ministry. They get involved in the church. They walk down the aisle. They make a profession of faith. They get baptized. They get involved in the church. They love it, and they're serving and all that, and one day they just disappear. People are going, what, 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 what happened to so-and-so? Well, they didn't like the music. Or they didn't like to preach it. Listen. They didn't like the building. They didn't like the children's program. Listen. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. Listen. The problem is not any of that stuff. The problem is their heart. Their heart. Jesus said that. That's what this parable explains. It's not a parable about the sower. It's a parable about you, and it's a parable about me. Number three, the destructive heart. We see that in verse 7 and verse 14. This is the heart where the weeds and the thorns choke it. There was seed planted, and it was going, and it was gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna grow and be something great. But there's there's some stuff that just comes along and chokes the life right out of that seed. Matthew's account, Matthew thirteen verse twenty two. He says, "The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches." This is a heart that has destructive forces that choke the seed of the word of God. In other words, someone comes to church, they hear the truth of the Word of God, they say, man, that's right, I need that, that's, that's what I need to do. But by the time they get in their car, or by the time they get to work on Monday, those forces start choking that very seed right out of their life. I want to share with you a quote by Dr. John MacArthur. When I read this quote, I want you to understand, this is a description 
of the United States of America right now. This quote was written many, many years ago. But it's a description of our country. It's a description of our world. It's a description of church people right now. Listen, listen up. He says these double-minded people illustrate the truth that a person cannot serve God and wealth. That's what Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24. Can't serve both God and wealth. They are consumed with temporal things, sinful pleasures, longings and desires, ambition and career and homes and cars and prestige and relationships and fame, all of which choke the seed of the gospel so they bring no fruit to maturity. This is the preoccupied heart swept away by the deceitfulness of riches. Paul wrote of such people, those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction, end quote. They end up in hell. These are people that, 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 that they have the seed of the Word of God planted in their heart, but there's all this other stuff that just chokes it out. There's a fourth response. That's the productive heart. Verses 8 and 15 explain that. This is the person who receives the Word of God in his or her heart, and there's fruit. Good soil is evidenced by the fruit it brings forth. Now, the Bible tells us that fruitfulness is the evidence of a genuine salvation experience, characterized by two things. Number one, the fruit in a change of attitude. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. There aren't nine fruits there. There's one fruit and nine qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, um, self-control. Uh, against things, there, there is no law. You don't need a law with people live like that. Their attitude's changed. If you've been saved, your attitude is going to change. But number two, the fruit of a change in action. The stuff you do. I want you to hear this. Over in Philippians chapter 1, Paul Paul lays it out clear, what a a saved person is supposed to look like. By the way, the church at Philippi is the first church that Paul planted in Europe. Did you know that? Very first one. There's something about first things, right? Your first boyfriend, your first girlfriend, your first kiss, your first job, your first wife. This was his first church that he planted in Europe. And he's talking about how much he loves them and and how what Jesus has started in in, in them, he's going to bring it to completion. And he says in verse uh, 8, for for God is my witness how I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now listen to this, verse 11. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. Does that describe you? Does that describe your walk with the Lord? It should. Now, I know this is a pretty heavy message, but there's some good news. Dr. John Phillips said, soil can usually be improved. No sower scatters seed on soil that has not been prepared and plowed and harrowed. Hard hearts can be softened. False beliefs can be uprooted. Truth of the matter is, you can change. In fact, we have a great example of that in John's Gospel, chapter 4. When, someone, when someone's heart has been changed, there will be fruit that indicates that change. The example in John 4 is the woman at the well. Remember that? Remember, Jesus went through Samaria. His disciples said, Lord, you can't go there. And he said, I must go through Samaria. Well, Lord, you, you can't go through Samaria. We're Jews. They're Samaritans. We, don't, we, we can't stand them. They can't stand us. He goes, I must go. And, and he made it in Samaria, and he made it to a well, and he was sitting there, and a woman showed up in the, at about 12 noon during the day with a bucket. Remember the story? And she was cold to Jesus at first. Verse 9 She said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman in Samaritan? She said, there's three problems that are wrong here with what's happening here. Number one, you're a Jew. You shouldn't be here. Number two, I'm a woman. You shouldn't be talking to me. And number three, I'm a Samaritan. We hate each other. She had a cold 
response. That's the unresponsive heart. But then number two, in verse 15, Jesus said to her, she had her bucket. She's getting ready to get water out of that well. And he said, listen, I have water that you don't know anything about. And if you drink of the water that I have, you'll never thirst again. And she said, give me this water. That's a picture of the impulsive heart. She just wanted it. You know, a lot of people are like that. Well, well, you know, if you do this, things will be better. If you, I mean, if you get those Facebook posts, if you repost this, suddenly, whatever. Have you ever seen those kind of goofy things? So, someone posted the other day. They said, get a job, go to work. Then you'll have money next week. You know, I mean, that's, you know, whatever. <laughs> Impulsive response. Number three, she lied about her husband's. Verse 17 and 18, this is the destructive heart. She said, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right, you've had five, and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. See, she was following her heart. She was having a good time. She was, she was following her heart, and her heart was taking her right to hell, and she didn't even know it, which is true about every one of us. Because if you follow your heart, I mean, there, that list of 21 things, our hearts are bad. Friend, listen, if you had a bad physical muscle called the heart today, you'd be at the doctor this afternoon. Wouldn't you? You'd say, ah, no big deal. I got a bad heart. No, 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 it's just a matter of time. We had dear friends in Florida, the church I pastored 12 and a half years, the, one of our elders, half of his, the bottom half of his heart was dead. I said, man, don't you need to be at the hospital? He goes, well, he goes, I'm okay, you know, technically, They said, you know, but I don't have a lot of time because all I got is the top part of the heart that's working. Now, let's go get that fixed. You you can't fix that. Well, go have an operation. You can't have an operation. Well, we'll, 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 we'll get a transplant. I'm too old for that. I mean, that's the problem. If your physical heart muscle was bad, you're, you're going to do something about it. And yet people, they're, they're the heart, the soul of their being, which is far more important than that little muscle, and they think, ah, it's no big deal. Yeah, it'll destroy you. It'll take you right to hell. But the story doesn't end there. When Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, you've had five, and this guy's not your husband, I mean, the seed of the Word of God had been planted, and she couldn't lie anymore. She said, how, 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 how do you know that? Are you, are you the Messiah? Well, I, mean, I mean, only God could know that. And he said, now we're talking. And her next response, she, she went into the town, verse 29, and she said, come see a man, come see a man who told me everything about my life and told me how it could be different, and I'm different today. And, and you remember the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed because of her testimony. Listen, friend, when your heart is changed, you'll be going to tell your friends and your family and your associates that you work with, you've got to know Jesus. You've got to be in church. You need to be under the teaching of the, of the Word of God. When your heart is changed, you'll be telling everybody. That's what she did. A changed heart will result in a changed life, and it will result in changing everything. So you know what I'm going to do this morning? I'm going to ask every one of you in this room to do what you know in your heart you need to do. I'm going to ask you to give your heart to Christ. For those of you who have never made that commitment in your life, I'm going to unashamedly and boldly and courageously say to you, 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 you shouldn't leave this campus until you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. It's that important. Some of you say, well, you've already done that, but you've never been baptized. You see, what happens is, see, the, the seed is planted in your heart, and you love Jesus, but the devil comes in, and he stops you right at baptism. Oh, you don't need to be baptized. So you follow your heart, and you haven't been baptized. Listen, you need to follow the Lord. Jesus was baptized. You need to follow his example. You, you need to not listen to your heart. You need to listen to the Word of God that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is what we do here. If you've not been baptized, you need to do that. If you're not a part of a church, you just, you just kind of come and watch, and you enjoy the fact that you just kind of sit on the edges, you don't ever have to get involved. That's not what the Bible says. 
You need to stop following your heart, and you need to become a part of the church, a contributing part, a, a, a viable part of the church. Others of you, you need to come today and say, God, I'm not following my heart anymore. I'm following you. I'm tired of the shame and the guilt. I'm tired of the embarrassment. I'm tired of the disillusionment. I'm tired of nothing working in my life. And I know it's my own heart. So I'm giving you my old heart today so I can get a new one. Don't follow your heart. Follow Him. Follow Him. Let's pray.